Angel is a 1945 film noir directed by Otto Preminger, adapted from a novel by Marty Holland, and starring Alice Faye, Dana Andrews, and Linda Darnell. The story follows a con man who ends up between two women, a waitress at a diner and a somewhat naive local woman. This strange love triangle ends up devolving into a murder case, with the con man desperate to avoid being arrested. Fallen Angel is an excellent film noir. Let's start off with that. The teaming of Dana Andrews and Otto Preminger produced several film noirs, but the most famous of these would be Laura from 1944. I really enjoy Laura as well, but I think that classic has probably overshadowed Fallen Angel, which is too bad because it's a completely engrossing movie. There are some similarities between the two films, which I'll get into later. Dana Andrews plays the cool, unfeeling con man I mentioned, and I think he was quite good. He's playing a thoroughly unlikable character for much of the movie, until very close to the end, actually. Early on, it's somewhat difficult to determine what his true feelings are, which works as he is orchestrating several situations to benefit himself. But at the same time, he felt a little stiff, even when he was supposedly professing his love for Linda Darnell's character. Later in the film, he admits that he's not sure if he loves her or not, but in those earlier moments, you don't get a good feel for what is really driving him, and that carries through almost to the end. I did enjoy the character, though, and while the movie is written in such a way that you can somewhat anticipate what his next moves will be, you're still left trying to figure out what makes him tick. Alice Faye was actually billed first, and she plays that straight-laced local woman that becomes roped into one of Dana Andrews' schemes and ends up falling for him in the process. After this movie, she didn't appear on screen again until 1962's State Fair. She had been mostly known for musicals up until Fallen Angel, and I think she's very good in the part. She and Dana Andrews are both a little older than their characters are intended to be, and with Alice Faye, it actually helps, giving the effect of her being a woman that had perhaps been getting used to the idea of becoming a uh, spinster, like her sister, but then quickly becomes enamored with this flattering stranger who claims to want to show her the world as she's never seen it before. The fallen angel of the title seems as though it could refer to her character, as she is this woman that has stayed sheltered by her sister, but is almost being corrupted by Dana Andrews. What I appreciated is her determination later in the movie to try to change him instead, and he sure needs changing. Linda Darnell plays the alluring waitress at the local diner, and she's great. Her character and her effect on most of the men in the movie is what reminded me of Jean Tierney's Laura. Everyone she meets seems to fall for her in a way, or become enchanted by her. Like Dana Andrews, her motivations are a little murky. She tells him several times that all she wants is a ring on her finger and a home to call her own, which both sound like wholesome ideas, but at the same time, she's willing to date seemingly any man that shows interest, accept gifts from them, even commit to marrying Dana Andrews shortly after meeting him while still going on frequent dates with Bruce Cabot's character. She isn't likable either, but you still stay hooked because, again, you're trying to figure out what she wants. Percy Kilbride plays her boss, the owner of the diner, and it was just exciting to see him outside of the Mon Pa Kettle series. I grew up watching that series a lot, and just hearing his voice makes me smile and feel nostalgic for that series. But anyway, he is perfect in this role. He is another example of every man becoming smitten with Linda Darnell, and we first meet him heartbroken at the prospect of her character having run away. He's such a kind, obliging character, and is a nice change of pace from most of the other schemers and backstabbers that populate this movie. Bruce Cabot shows up as one of Linda Darnell's boyfriends, constantly picking her up or dropping her off. It's a small role with very little dialogue, but he gives off the right attitude as a kind of sleazy, ladies' man type. Charles Bickford plays a detective that pops up here and there earlier in the movie, and then becomes more prominent when a murder happens. He's another unreadable character at first, until he reveals a brutal side to him during the murder investigation, specifically during an interrogation. It's not a great role, and I wish Charles Bickford had a little more to do, but he brings the appropriate, authoritative presence that the character needs. John Carradine has a small part as a traveling psychic, and while he doesn't get much of a chance to go full John Carradine, he's still fun. His character and the mentions of a spook show, and the fact that Dana Andrews' character is named Stanton, all were fun little reminders of Nightmare Alley, which actually came out two years after this one, but was also produced by Fox. Even the novel Nightmare Alley was only written in 1946, so I'm guessing the similarities, as superficial as they are, are only coincidental. And finally, Anne Revere plays Alice Faye's older sister, a strict, careful woman that the rest of the town seemed to look to as a moral bar to clear. She was perfect casting. 
coming across as severe, but also never a bad guy, holding her sister back from exploring the world. Everything she does is for her sister's benefit, and out of love for her. One reason I enjoyed this movie as much as I did is because it's for the most part a small town noir. Film noir is known for urban settings, lots of cops and gangsters and the like, but Fallen Angel spends most of its time in a small California town. There are disreputable people prowling around, and the movie does make a couple of stops in San Francisco, but you get such a great sense of small town politics and the undercurrents of jealousy and gossip that are running under the town's peaceful surface. The look of the town, too, with wide, tree-lined streets is great. The location photography is a highlight of so many of these 20th Century Fox Noirs, and it doesn't disappoint. The house where Alice Faye lives is this wonderful two-story house on a corner with a sidewalk running right to their door. The church that shows up in several shots until Dana Andrews meets Alice Faye there while she's playing the organ is great as well, both in terms of its look and what it represents for the story. It's as though this large white church is drawing him there until finally the sound of her playing pulls him inside. And from that point on, he is taking her farther and farther away from the church, both the building itself and the faith that it represents. But as we get further into the movie, that begins to change. The turning point comes in the scene at the hotel that they have fled to. I should mention, the movie does make a leap when they get married so suddenly. It's all a part of his plan to abscond with her inheritance money, and I understand it needs to move that quickly for the story to work, but it seems so out of character and impulsive for Alice Faye. It's not just here, though. Getting married after knowing someone for two or three days is a mainstay of older films, be they screwball comedies or bleak film noirs. But back to the hotel. Alice Faye is trying to convince Dana Andrews to not continue running from the murder charge that is potentially hanging over his head. They have a fight, he loses his cool, she does as well, but then they both calm down and wait out the night there. The transition to the next morning is excellent, showing the darkened window standing open, and then, as dawn breaks, we see the Golden Gate Bridge come into focus as the sun rises. I think it's this great representation of their marriage having become strengthened, and showing how from that point on, his character is hopefully going to be different. From there to the end of the movie, the town, and by extension the church, is drawing them back to it. And this formerly wandering con man's last words of the movie are that he wants to go home. And this is a guy who has never wanted or had a home. I better stop there before I give away too much. Alice Faye is wonderful in those scenes at the hotel, and is such a hopeful character for a film noir. It could seem sentimental or naive, but I really liked how she demonstrates this unconditional love for her new husband. The marriage might have been totally ill-advised, and it definitely was, but she is determined to make the best of it and try to turn this man around from the path that he has been on. I also appreciated how Dana Andrews doesn't really seduce Alice Faye early on, like you might expect. On the contrary, their relationship is quite chaste, which sets up a good future for them. What first draws her to him are his declarations of taking her to concerts and traveling and fancy clothes. So both don't go in with the best motives, but you see each of them change once the reality of their marriage sets in. The cinematography is excellent, and my favorite shot is probably the one where Dana Andrews and Alice Faye exit a diner to walk across the street to a bank. The shot begins inside the diner, and from that angle, it looks like it could be filmed in the studio. The typical studio lighting makes the shot look quite normal for a movie like this. But then the camera backs out of the doorway, and we find ourselves on an actual street, with the actors pushing out onto the sidewalk. And suddenly we're in natural light, and it looks how these gritty noirs started to look in the 40s. It's this beautiful shot that captures both looks in one, and I loved it. After the con man maneuvering earlier in the movie, it's a lot of fun when the last act suddenly turns into a murder mystery, complete with a twist that I really didn't see coming. Although, on reflection, there is a nice hint close to the beginning. I won't spoil anything in regards to that here, but I loved how the opening scene ties in with the murder scene. Each character that was present for the opening that introduces most of the characters in the movie is in attendance at the crime scene. And, coincidentally enough, it's the same person that brings them all together in both cases. On the DVD, part of the Fox Film Noir collection, there are some publicity stills included that seem to indicate a different ending was shot that is vastly different from what is in the finished film, including what appears to be a different fate for the killer. If there are any deleted scenes out there that still exist, I would love to see them. They also show a scene between two characters that I'm guessing would have also appeared late in the movie, but again is not present. I'm very curious as to why that was changed and what other changes that would have resulted in had that ending been chosen. So, if you haven't seen Fallen Angel, I highly recommend it. Without giving too much away, it's a rare film noir that kind of has a happy ending, which I was not expecting. 
The performances are all really enthralling. Dana Andrews in particular has a great arc. The cinematography is everything you want in a film noir and is overall such an engaging story. I loved it. Thanks so much for watching my review. If you enjoyed this, I hope you'll check back as I discover or rediscover more forgotten film noirs in the future. Thanks again, and adios for now.